Hi, Walter. Hi, Sonia. It's great to meet you again. I'm looking much forward to our talk today. Yes, I'm too. And uh, uh, the last, I remember, we, we are trying to do these hard talks for actually people to make, uh, understand how the, you know, how Mr. Walter Lubeck has become who he is. And uh, you are a founder of Rainbow Reiki. You are a musician. You're um, a spiritual practitioner. You're you're too many in one person, and uh, we've been talking. <laughs> we've been talking to you about your childhood, about your adolescent, and uh, uh, and you also spoke about interesting stuff uh, in terms of music and how music has been healing for you, and mm -hmm. it's been healing a lot of other people around you while you're practicing music. Mm -hmm. I know you're a drummer. And, yeah, uh, that's right. I play drums and I also play electronic drums like uh, uh, the Korg Wave Drum um, or the Hand Sonic, Roland von Hand Sonic. And uh, I play synthesizers and I more and more use the iPad because it has great um, apps for controlling the DAWs, meaning digital audio workstations on my laptops. So I can uh, use the great uh, touch uh, applications of the, the iPad to um, just play music on my notebook, my laptop, when I have uh, running, for example, Logic Pro or uh, Ableton Live or this kind of uh, software, um, it is much more versatile than uh, using regular keyboards, you know, which I also have, but uh, they are in my individual a perception more stone age than doing music with the iPad. Okay, interesting. Um, in once, like, I think you, uh, you're doing a lot of uh, musical retreats even nowadays. Um, yes, I do, uh, I do internet concerts uh, uh, regularly uh, about once per month. And um, before that, I uh, had shows on uh, festivals, on spiritual fairs, but also when I have larger uh, classes when in the evening I do music and I often use music during a webinar or during a seminar for um, uh, accompany me when I give guided meditations. Right, I think during some of our talks we will maybe want people to listen to a, a kind yes. of a trailer of music that you do. It'll be really nice for them to hear but uh, may not be today. Um, uh, what I, my question to you comes, uh, Walter, you because you have been into not just Reiki, you're rather co-founded, mm -hmm. but you're also into shamanism and you're also into the feminine energy. Tell me when you passed your adolescent and how your journey brought you into different areas of this spiritual mm -hmm. world. How did this happen? Yeah, um, first of all, I, when I entered my 20s, I was um, headed for the business world. So I wanted to go into... Uh, um, German or international economy and I was uh, uh, working with two partners uh, in a company who served, um, still serves, it's still existing, the international um, oil drilling market and uh, the mining market uh, with special protectors and uh, equipment which is safe uh, when it comes to fire and these kind of things. So I traveled a lot and I uh, had much time to read when I was lonely in my hotel apartment or when I had a stop on the road, I was reading things. So um, while, I, while I did the job in the industry, and it was interesting as a production manager, I was uh, in charge for, um, for sales partially and for uh, product development. So I was making kind of link between our, uh, our tool building department and the, the clients. And so I had to go to the minings, into the mines deep down into the earth, you know, two kilometers below the earth. And I had to go on the oil fields and uh, uh, talk with the people who uh, operate the rigs and, you know, the roughnecks doing the daily work, which is really, uh, I have great respect for these people. That, that's uh, an incredible job they do. And um, in the times I had off, and of course this was a lot because in the evenings I didn't have anything to do. They had families and, they didn't want to uh, um, go out. And uh, also when I was driving and I had um, 
had a break or so. I was reading books about um, spiritual topics, about practical esoterics, and I used the pendulum and I used the oracle like I Ching or tarot cards or um, the runes. But um, I had less time for these things than before. What I did was um, lengthy vacations. I had about three, four week vacations in summertime. And during these times, I was um, uh, driving with my, my girlfriend uh, into places, for example, in the Bretagne or Normandy, northern part of France, where you have these big stones, the megalith, where there is uh, Mont Saint-Michel. I was uh, visiting the um, valley of the Loire, and there is a special, um, special uh, castle. And parts of that have been built according to uh, plans of Leonardo da Vinci. Very interesting, very interesting, very, very strong energy and very high energy. And um, I visited uh, Chartres, I visited other places, and of course used the pendulum and uh, contact the spiritual guide over there. It became a kind of, um, of habit that wherever I was, uh, when I had time, I um, took off my shoes, took off my socks, and uh, like shamans do when they want to get in contact to the earth spiritual guides, uh, I was just walking around barefoot and it doesn't matter whether it was winter or summertime. I never got a cold because of that, you know. And when I gave later classes and told people to put off shoes and socks in wintertime when there was lots of snow and it was cold, they, they said, are you crazy? We will get a cold. I said, no, you will not. Because when you are in contact with the spiritual guides of the earth, then uh, the land takes care for you. You, you won't get anything. And nobody did. Of course, some didn't dare to do it, but uh, I always was showing them that it's, uh, it's possible and it's no big deal. And some of them just uh, uh, took the adventure, which is a little adventure, you know, if you compare this to going to the Amazon or something. But uh, it, it was something new for them and they, they felt the earth in different ways. So when I want to do um, a, a ritual, which uh, has much energy also, take off shoes and socks and have direct contact to the earth. Uh, in fact, when I, um, when I do uh, certain rituals which um, have big impact on my life or the life of others, I do this, as we say, sky clad, so I don't wear anything. And of course, this even today in our times is a little bit um, difficult for people to, to understand, while um, this usually has no uh, sexual context. Uh, people understand it as something like a swingers club or something, but it's not. It's, it's just that you are going there like the creator made you. So you, you show your true self. Most people don't understand the power, the magic, which is in your true self. Yeah. Because the creator brought you down in a special way, and you are a very special tool which is able to do great things, genius things, but only in a very special area. So, and, and that, if you, if you do a ritual and, and you do it sky clad, that could be a symbol, like you use many symbols when you do rituals, it's the language of the subconscious, that now you are with your true self, with your magical self, with a self which the creator wants you to be instead with what your ego wants you to be, your, your parents, your neighbors, your teachers, colleagues, whatever. And um, sometimes I did these rituals when I was on the road and I had some time and I uh, explored um, spiritual power spots. And I was um, then also getting into classes like Tai Chi Chuan and Qigong and, and yoga. Um, but it was more like, um, having some balance to the workday. What really was um, uh, putting me down more and more over the years when I got into the midst of my 20s were depressions. So I more and more played um, sad music. I, I wasn't able to play anything um, happy anymore. And I thought about suicide, but that was a complete nonsense from the rational point of view because I had a, I had a great apartment, a really good apartment, like a penthouse. I had a wonderful car. I had a beautiful girlfriend. I had uh, four weeks of vacation in the summer and two weeks in the winter time. I made more money every year. Um, I had a uh, much appreciation at my work and I got more and more sad, more and more. And 
with my family, I couldn't talk about that. They didn't understand it. They, they said, you have everything. What do you want? You know? So um, I didn't know what it was, uh, but um, it, it needed to be solved. Another thing I did starting when I was 18, I was going to international investment seminars. So with, um, with people who were professional investors in the stock market mostly, uh, which flew in from, from all around the world and gave lessons for several days for a week or so in places like Lausanne or Geneva or Munich or Frankfurt or Luxembourg. And um, I learned a lot from them. At that time, I also did a lot of investment with my own money in the stock market and um, earned good money then, which I used for vacation and for books and for um, for great um, furniture in my apartment because I love beautiful things, you know. I I love beautiful furniture. I love beautiful paintings. I love um, things which show the grace of God when you look at them, when you feel them, you know. Also good smells. I love good perfume. So um, uh, I, I did this investor classes and I met a lot of interesting people because many of the people going there, they were not going for the money. They wanted to use the money, but they were not going for the money, if you know what I mean. They, they wanted to, to get some money so they could have a year off and um, do a sail trip through the Greek islands, or they wanted to have a year off and go to Tibet and Nepal and um, uh, places in India to, uh, to expand the spirituality. Other people just said, I want to go to painting class. I want to be a professional painter, but at the moment I cannot do it. I need, I need about a year or two to have a time out and I need money to pay for that, these kind of things. Of course, some of them were there for the money, and uh, I had not much, um, not much discussion with them because uh, that was so weird. When I was um, 18, in the first class which I ever uh, got in the investment market, I met a great guy. This was Mr. Andrei Costolani. Uh, some people in, in Germany, Austria, or France, or Benelux uh, countries might might still know him. He wrote lots of books, dozens of books, great books about investment, but he is a studied musician and philosopher. So he did about five, six years of uh, university education, partially in Budapest, partially in Paris, um, in um, philosophy and in music. And then he was going in the investment world and made lots of money and also was two or three times broke, I guess. But he ended up as a multi, multi, multi millionaire with penthouses in New York and Paris and a villa at the Côte d'Azur and so on. And when I got into his class, he already was at the end of his 70s. So he was someone, you know, with a, a big um, uh, article in each Capital Magazine, which is the biggest finance magazine in Germany and lots of books in each and every bookstore. And I asked him much about how can I earn money with this and how get do I get more money with that and so on. I was 18, you know, I wanted to, to have money to have a good life. And um, then in one of the breaks, he came to me and said in, in his Hungarian German, you, Mr. Walter, what do you want with all that money? You know, you talk about money all the time. You should go with your girlfriend to the opera and have a good dinner in the restaurant and, and listen to good music. That is, that is what you should do. You not know? think about money all the time, you know? And because he was such an impressive guy and he really was knowing what he was talking about, knowing all the, all the very rich people, very influential people, I listened to him. If he would have been 30 years younger and not that impressive personality, I thought I think I would have listened here and would go out there, you know. So, but I listened to him and uh, I understood that my approach was wrong. And this is why I um, behaved in a different way when I was uh, visiting these other investment classes and uh, was um, more going there for understanding psychology and philosophy because. You see, when you give people money or you give them power, it is like um, putting on the light to their character. 
you might not know what character they have when they don't have much power much, or not much money. But when you give them much more of this, much more, this might be for someone a uh, thousand euros more per month for others. It means maybe a million more. It, it depends. Yeah. So then you will see whether they are good hearted, good natured, or whether they are predators. And I was always interested in what moves people. So when, uh, when people like Costolani and others of same, let's say, reputation, were talking about investment philosophy and psychology, that was most interesting for me to understand what moves people. Why do they buy this or that? And why do they avoid that? And what uh, was, uh, was very much making me think was that they all said, you need to learn to deal with your fears because you, if, uh, if you don't learn to heal your fears, you are not a good investor. Maybe you make much money, but you will never be happy. And I listened carefully. So um, when I got into this, this depression phase, I had some influential backups, so to say, but it wasn't enough. So um, I guess it was in the midst of my 20s. I, you know, it's, it's long ago, so I do not know exactly the year. It might be 84, it might be 85, something like that. And I, um, I thought about suicide, but I thought that is weird that forget about that. You need to do something, something better than that, you know, throwing away your life. Why? And I looked into the yellow pages. We have yellow pages in, in Germany today. Most people don't use them anymore, but because they have internet. But at that time, it was the best thing you could get. And um, I was looking for, for counseling. I, I thought, I did bodybuilding, I know a lot of bodybuilding. I did sports, you know, pumping iron and doing martial um, sports. And uh, I thought if there was something like, like bodybuilding, maybe there's also something like mind building. <laughs> so I was looking for, yeah, you know, <laughs> I look, was looking into um, uh, the charts of uh, Yellow Pages for counseling. And I found a counseling institute. I was going there, uh, made a date, and there was, a kind lady. She was, I think, in the midst of her 40s or something. And um, I told her about my sadness and that I had a good job and a beautiful wife and uh, lots of vacations, but I was sad. I was thinking about suicide. And then she asked me, yeah, and, uh, what, what about the unborn child? What is your position to that? I said, what unborn child? Uh, and I was going on telling about my life. And then she said, yeah, come on. But now come to the point. What about the pregnancy? I said, what? What pregnancy? She said, well, because this is an institute for counseling parents who have um, an unwanted pregnancy, whether they go for abortion or not, or have the child. I said, what? Uh, but uh, fortunately, the lady also had um, a private institute for psychotherapy groups and one-to-one and, uh, -one sessions. So I was booking um, her and I was going there for the next, I think was about seven years or so. I was going there once a week uh, and also to weekend classes and I uh, had one-to-one -one meetings and I was in group sessions and so on. I did a lot of stuff. And um, the first years, believe it or not, I had no idea what they wanted. They always told me, what is it with your emotions? What, what do you feel? I said, uh, of course I have feelings, but I don't know what you want to hear. You know, I, I had no idea. What I could tell them, I had these wonderful business suits, you know, Armani and Versace, and I had uh, all the right colors and all the right shoes. And uh, uh, they told me, you need to loosen that tie. And I said, that's a great tie. I love that tie, you know. It costs a hell of a lot of money, and I really love to look at it. And they said, yeah, but you know, this tie, you know, it it's not good for you. It's it's uh, It strangles you. And I told them, you forget it about that symbolism, you know, it's just a tie. They said, you will see. So it was a difficult time for me. And um, the first breakthrough came when um, we did some bioenergetics analysis. And um, I, um, I got the opportunity uh, in a kind of uh, symbolical uh, group uh, application mm -hmm. to, uh, to show how I felt with my family. Uh -huh. I was born in and about six, seven people were holding me on the ground, on the feet and the legs. Mm -hmm. And the, um, one of the therapists told me to, uh, to do a special breathing pattern. 
and just shout out, yell, you know? Uh -huh. And I said, why should I do that? He said, just try it. I said, come on, I, I can yell. Well, what, what's the reason? What's, yeah. He said, do it, just do it. Give it a chance, five minutes, okay? So I did it and after a while I exploded. The people were flowing through the room and I was running out of the um, practice and I was running for about, I don't know, 40 minutes, 60 minutes. I was running, running. I, I came back when um, most people already have left because I need to get rid of that energy, which yeah. was released then. That was the first breakthrough. I remember it like it was happening yesterday. And then um, it was 87. And um, through the, um, one of the therapists uh, who recommended a um, naturopathic doctor to me because I also got ill. I had um, problems with immune system and uh, was sleepy all the time, had a kind of chronic fatigue syndrome and uh, uh, problems with, the, um, um, with getting motivated, yeah. So he um, uh, referred to me a naturopathic doctor. I was going there and uh, he and his wife, they treated me. And um, once I saw a kind of uh, certificate on the wall and it told about Uzui Reiki. And I understood anything Japanese like, like martial arts, you know. Martial arts, so, you know. <laughs> I asked the person, um, did you attend a class about martial arts? He said, no, why do you think that? And he said, well, uh, I said, see the certificate on the wall. Uh, he uh, grinned and said, no, no, it's not about martial arts. It's, it's something different. And in four weeks, there will be a class about that here in my practice. I organize it for a teacher from Frankfurt and you go there. I said, yeah, um, and what is good for? What, what do they do in this class? Uh, they, and he said, I, I won't tell you. It's, it's good for you, just come. So I booked this class and I had absolutely no idea what it was about. At that time, there were, I think, one or two books about Reiki, I think one. And you didn't get it in the bookstore. It was sold in the classes, you know. And believe it or not, it, it was a time when in the whole German language area, Austria, Germany, Switzerland, there were about five or six Reiki teachers. That was it. And some of them were traveling from country to country. So you would be happy just to meet someone who knew that there was a Reiki class going on. Um, so I booked this class and it was uh, some money at that time. I think it was about 280 German marks or so. So at that time it was not a fortune, but it was some money. So um, I was going to that class on Friday evening and there were interesting people. It, it was a small room, you know, I think about, uh, 12, 14 square meters, and there were about 30 people. It was cramped. We are, you know, side oh. by side. And then came this teacher from Frankfurt. She was an attractive woman with, uh, you know, colorful clothing and uh, gold chains. And she was uh, singing a lot of songs of devotion and I said that was very interesting. And then we introduced ourselves and there was a couple, they said that um, last weekend they had been at a Huna class. I had no idea what Huna was. And um, the guy said, well, that he understood now that he in fact is a bear. And his wife said, and she is a penguin. I thought, well, that's interesting, but they did not seem to be dangerous. You know, another woman said that she was creating her own shoes and, and making her own shoes. She had a kind of shoe shop. She said, because the industrially made shoes, they had bad energy. She does not want to have bad on her feet. So she was making her own shoes and the shoes looked self-made, but they worked. So, and <laughs> the, there was another woman and she said that um, since the teacher of the Reiki class came in, her Kundalini was rising all the time, you know? And then there was a, an old guy and he could have been 60, could have been 70. But when he introduced himself, he said he was 95 years old, 95, 95 years old. And uh, he was an impressive guy, big guy, you know, about two meters and very broad shoulders. And he was asked why he attended the class. And he said, well, when I was in the beginning of my 70s, I was diagnosed with terminal cancer. So no chance, the doctor say, just do your 
do your will and last will and and then you know just it that was it and then he met a dowser a professional dowser and the dowser helped him to get rid of that cancer and then he studied dowsing for a year or two and was a professional dowser himself he was retired but he was getting into a new job so to say and was doing dowsing jobs for for people and then he said i'm doing this now for 20 years and when you do something for 20 years you need to do something else so i thought i go into reiki and get reiki education and do reiki now and i thought wow that's an interesting perspective because my family it was like you know when you got 50 um then you think about who gets the carpet and uh what will be your last car and these kind of things and this guy with 95 years thought to go into a new job so um, I had a completely new idea of life. Um, and uh, during this class, it was, it was interesting because people said they were seeing angels and energy was going up and down, Kundalini rising and enlightenment coming to them. And we were singing all these songs, which seemed to me like Christmas carols. And of course, I was used to get in contact with angels, but they, they behaved in a very strange way, at least for me. Later, I understood that this was the habit in the esoteric community, and I adjusted to that. But at that time, it was a little bit weird. I did not know much about classes, esoteric classes. So um, when I was driving uh, home at uh, Sunday evening, I thought, well, that was an interesting weekend. And uh, of course, it, was not, it wasn't cheap, but it was something different, you know, and if you would have gone to to a good restaurant, had a good wine, and afterwards going to the clubs and so on, you also would have some spent some decent money on that. And um, then on Monday morning, when I was in my car, I was driving to my work, I had my hands on the wheel, as I should, and uh, they were starting to get hot. And it was a tingling sensation, sensation up my arms to my shoulders. And I thought, what the heck is that, you know? And this was going on for many weeks. Whenever I had my hands somewhere for a longer period of time, they were tingling. They were, there was something moving and it was going up to my shoulders and, and my uh, chest and so on. Then I realized there must have been some change. And then when it was Tuesday, there was this um, psychotherapy group again. And uh, we did these group sessions with about 12, 14 people plus the therapists. And um, I always had a problem since years when someone was going into emotional crisis, was sad and weeping. I, I thought about, should I go there? But what will they think if I go there? Should I hug them and say something kind to them? No, but maybe they don't want that and so on. But that evening, someone started crying. I was walking over hugged the person and uh, said to her some, some kind things and uh, was uh, holding her for a while. And when that was over, I was going back to my place. And when I was taking seat again, I thought, what did you do? Because that was completely different behavior from what I was used to do. And then I understood that Reiki not just changes your energetical system that you can pass on healings, but it changes you. There was big change within me. And um, from that moment on, I understood there will be some changes in my life, but I had no idea what it would be. And it was about um, a year later when I decided to get out of the company and I had a vague idea of doing a spiritual magazine. Because uh, after I visited this Reiki class, I thought, if I would not have known this naturopathic doctor, I would have had no idea that this class was going on. But I think more people should know about that these kinds of events are happening. And so I um, said goodbye to the company and became, uh, I don't know how you call this in English, uh, a partner, but not working anymore. And um, I got myself an Atari computer and a NEC P6 printer uh, with high resolution, you know, 300 DPI and it needed just a half hour to print one page in the highest resolution, only half an hour. And um, so I was um, starting to produce a spiritual magazine and I was uh, getting to know people. I was networking. I was finding um, shops, uh, organic food stores and um, magazine shops and so on, newspaper stands, 
that they distributed my magazine in the whole of northern Germany. And I was doing this, uh, this magazine for, uh, I think it was two and a half or three years. And it had um, in the peak 15,000 um, copies printed per month. And I did interviews with uh, famous people. I was writing about books, about music. I wrote editorials and um, discussed topics which were up to date and I created, let's say, um, esoteric scene in Northern Germany, which was much better connected when I left doing the magazine than when I came into it. Okay. And um, that helped me a lot to, to be known in the esoteric community because after a while, most people knew me that I was doing this magazine. I, I was going to restaurants, you know, organic food restaurants, vegetarian restaurants, and um, was uh, eating there and writing about what they were doing and how the meals were and so on. Um, I had a, a recipe of the month and um, I did interviews with book authors. So during this time, I also decided um, that I wanted to uh, become a, a Reiki teacher, a master, third degree. So I was going for the, for the training. And um, after I finished the training, it was in, um, in September uh, 89, I already was so well known that my first class was full, like that. And from that moment on, I was giving lots of classes and I needed to make a decision because I couldn't give the classes and do, doing the magazine. So I was um, passing on the magazine to the owner of an esoteric bookstore uh, in, uh, in Hanover and was focusing on the, on the seminars. And then I discovered something interesting. I discovered the missing link between shamanism and Reiki mm -hmm. by chance. Uh, I was reading a lot in the public library in Hanover and um, I was just by chance finding some books about a guy writing about Huna, Max Freedom Long. And there was not one word about Reiki, but the concept which he wrote about fits to any kind of energy work, whether it's yoga, qigong, or northern runes, energy work, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's a kind of language to understand energy work and spirituality. And I thought, what a great work. And I read it all. And I applied it to Reiki and I got ideas. I got ideas. So I was putting this into my classes. And what I also found out even in the first class I gave that I taught content I had never heard about before. I did never read about before. Nobody told me about that, but it was to the point it worked practically very well. People were amazed and I had to start to write my own manuals because the manuals which I got from my teacher uh, did not have the content which I was um, teaching. And by using the background knowledge of Max Friedman Long's version of Huna, which I now understand is not the original Huna, but it, it is anyway a great idea, great set of ideas. I got, for example, the method to get in contact with higher self and inner child, with part personalities, astrological part personalities. I got uh, ideas how to do Reiki to the past, to the future, uh, how to work together with spiritual guides, angels, uh, medicine animals, how to do channeling with the help of Reiki, and so on and so on. Astral traveling, uh, oh, producing oh, oh. amulets and talismans with the help of Reiki, which otherwise, uh, of course, I knew how to do that when it came to shamanism, but um, it's much more complicated with, with Reiki. It's easy. So uh, during this time, I um, had the idea that... Uh, there is much more in Reiki than I heard in the classes which I took. You know, I had about, uh, from 87 to 89, I had uh, uh, lots of Reiki classes with the teacher I was uh, going to. And compared to other teachers, she knew a lot 
and she was interested in Reiki, but I understood also from my background of uh, martial arts that this was not the real thing, that there was much more. Mm -hmm. And I started to do research, I started to dig. So um, during this time also my um, memories were getting I wouldn't say more vivid, but I, I listened more to them and understood that they were memories and not just, uh, you know, daydreams. And then in the beginning of the 90s, there was this enlightenment and spiritual realization situation in the northern part of uh, France when I did this work with higher self of Mont Saint-Michel and uh, the megaliths and Karnak and Bretagne and Normandy and so on. And I had this incredible energy getting up inside of me and I had to find ways to work with it so a lot of things were coming together and um, I had to run a lot to get rid of the energy and uh, I had to do intense martial arts training to get it out and um, over the years I learned then to um, use it which uh, is the original purpose of this kundalini energy that you put it to use so it was um, for me at the time a very um, complicated process of understanding what was going on i had no spiritual teacher and i uh, even i knew about spiritual teachers and i thought that they are a good idea but i could not go to any because i felt that I already had a spiritual path and that they could not show me something better. That does not mean that I do not respect them. I respect them perfectly, but I understood even without having any evidence at that time that there was already that path for me, but I just had to get conscious about it. And for that, they could not help. I had to do that. I what helped me a lot was... Yes. I just want to break you here because there are two mm, questions please. which comes to mm. my mind. One is this that when you were getting so much of energy, which you call it as Kundalini uh, energy Kundalini. coming in your body, <clears throat> uh, how how did you first of all recognize that energy, and what did you do to make that energy come in use for your spiritual journey? Yeah, that's an interesting question. You see. Um, Later, I remembered more about uh, my lives as a spiritual teacher and healer and understood more about Kundalini. And in the book I have co-authored, Big Book of Reiki Symbols, I have written about 200 pages uh, about um, spiritual philosophy. And there are also several pages about uh, different ways of Kundalini rising. For me at that time, it started with the um, activation of heart chakra. And the heart chakra is in the center between the material oriented chakras and the spiritually oriented chakras. That's only a rough explanation, but let's take it that way for a moment. And um, the heart chakra has the function, one of the functions of it is to bring the spiritual potential from your light body, from your angelic self, from your, let's say, spiritual self, down into each of the chakras so that it can be put into the web of the yin of the material world existence so um, in the beginning of let's say a troubleless enlightenment and spiritual um, realization a troubleless kundalini rising there's always an awakening of the heart and this is not like you love everybody and it's everything is great like you know what positive thinkers think no you love everything everybody every little piece of dust you love every person animal plant whatsoever each pebble and at the same time you see very clearly their shortcomings learning topics weaknesses so it is not that um, that pink glasses which you have on. It is a different kind of love. Mm. And you love them all the same. So you cannot differentiate. Mm. When 
that started, it was a weird feeling for me. Oh, let's say a weird state because it's not a feeling, it's a state. And I had to learn to deal with it because it was so overwhelming. And then came these waves of energy, which mm -hmm. made me stand up in the middle of the night because I was so full of energy that I did not know what to do with it. And uh, I had nobody to ask because all the people I knew from the magazine, they told about Kundalini and enlightenment. But when I was asking them, I found out they had no idea. They read something or they heard something, but they had no idea. So um, that does not mean that there were bad people. They were not, but they just had no clue of that. So um, I found out that um, sports help you to get rid of some energy, even if it's produced again. Good sex helps, also um, garden work, uh, but you need to do something physical and you need something which your body enjoys. And then I learned with the help of my spiritual guides, which also helped me before when I was in my teenage years a lot, to understand that um, the Kundalini energy is not meant to just be there and impress people. It is uh, for doing the work. When I was uh, getting into professional esoterics, I was about 28 years old, 28, 29 years old. And this is when there was the first return of Saturn. That's in everybody's horoscope. And the first return of Saturn means you need to make your mind up what do you want to do with your life spiritually. And this is a time which I learned later when my bodhisattva wow was uh, activated and I had to make a decision whether I want to have a, let's say, a normal life or whether I want to have a, a life as a spiritual teacher and healer. I decided for spiritual teacher and healer. I could have done otherwise because there is nobody pushing you into something, mm -hmm. but you need to make a decision, which I did. Yeah. And um, I understood that you get this energy and you get, let's say the wisdom, the information. Um, wisdom is the kind of use of information you make, not just information when you have projects which you want to perform, which you want to proceed in, in life. So I wanted to um, help people to realize that they are spiritual healers. I wanted to help them to understand how they could make this world a better place. And I wanted to help them to understand that everybody also is a son or a daughter of divine. So that is my, until today, my, my vision. And um, I was teaching classes and I started to write books about that because I thought people need authentic texts about these things. And I used the medium Reiki. And Reiki has one big advantage as a system of energy work, as an energy, it does not exclude anything. There are people who use it in a way which is like, you are a member of a church, but this is not Reiki. Reiki as an energy and as a system has no limits. You can use it for shamanism, you can use it for tantra, you can use it for crystal work, angel work, name it. And I found out how to do that because of questions of my students. Let's say 80% and the rest was what I found uh, did not work when I gave sessions. I gave a lot of sessions. I did lots of healings and often it worked great and sometimes it did not. And that, then I thought, what, what is the difference? Because usually it works, why not here? And the same I experienced when there were students coming to me, they said, well, we, we were using Reiki for this and that, it worked great, and then we did it for this, and it does not work. Why? I tried to find out why, and I tried to find solutions, and I um, got a lot of insights into what Reiki is doing and um, how you can help better. So my, my classes developed. At the same time, I was very put down by the international associations, which at that time represented Reiki, I thought 
when I go there to these people who are masters since 10 years or so, um, they would answer my questions and they would support me on my path. But when I did the first question in a, in a circle of these masters, they all started to shout, ah, yeah. And I was asking why a homeopathic remedy, Nux Vomica, did not work anymore for a horse with a colic when Reiki was used to treat the horse. And they all started to shout. And I thought, what's going on? Did I miss something? Then when they were calming down, I asked again the question. Everybody started again, ah, yeah. They thought, what the heck is going on here? I didn't ask anymore. Later, when we were going to lunch, one of the older masters took me aside and said, we don't ask these questions here. We trust Reiki. I said, come on, am I in a church here? So um, these kind of situations, I had uh, several until I understood it's not the place for me. I stepped out of church when I was right after uh, confirmation, I think when I was 30 or something. Uh, so I didn't want to go in back into a church where I had to believe, you know. And I met masters of Aikido, of Tai Chi Chuan, earlier of, of karate, true masters, not just black belts, you know, higher grades. And when these guys came into a dojo, into a room, even if they were just one meter 50, yeah, the room was full. And of course, they were the focus of attention, not because of the belt, usually they didn't have one, yeah. but because of the personality and the energy. And when you were asking them a question, they demonstrated it, the answer, they told you the answer, and they made you feel the answer. While when I came to these Reiki circles, the masters had no energy, no personality, no knowledge, no wisdom. So I thought the idea that you just get an initiation to Reiki and this makes you spiritually more evolved is wrong. There must be a missing ingredient. Later, I learned what it is. We can but, just, yeah. We can just, this is like now I wanted to just say that when um, uh, there were like two more questions, which I will take it in next time, but yes, we'll take the Reiki journey. we will take the Reiki journey uh, because I know mm -hmm. that uh, you've been through, but this was very wonderful to know that uh, how you indulge yourself into Reiki and how you yeah. indulge yourself into some other side of Reiki, not in the classical mm -hmm. side of Reiki. Yeah. So you gave reason why you were going uh, in Reiki, but away from Reiki and finding your own answers in Reiki. Yeah. Walter Lubeck, thank you so much for this fantastic description of how you could see Reiki and your spiritual journey, most of all. And um, I look uh, forward to talking to you in other times and other, other days. Thank you, Sadia. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Hmm.